thank you som for that wonderful introduction and uh, thank you jackson for giving me this opportunity to present my work um, in this uh, lecture series i did my graduate work in the development of novel humanized mouse models especially in the field of uh, clinical transplantation and uh, solid organ transplants so in this beginning slide i just want to give a brief introduction into the field of solid organ transplantation and specifically kidney transplants so solid organ transplants uh, represents a life saving technique and it's very commonly uh, performed within the us it's only uh, it's the only therapeutic uh, intervention if the patient uh, faces end stage organ failure in 2019 alone around 33000 transplants were carried out across the us Uh, one of the most interesting facts about transplantation especially kidney transplantation is that uh, around 30 to 35% of the uh, patients who receive the transplant uh, subsequently uh, uh, reject the donor um, organ kidney within the first 10 years uh, because of this what you see is that 20% of transplants uh, uh, carried out across the us are repeated transplants that is the uh, patient received an organ and then uh, uh, in the period of 10 years they rejected it and they required a secondary organ so this is a very uh, important problem within the us itself because there is a general paucity in the uh, amount of available organs so in transplant rejection uh, is a very complicated uh, process uh in especially in the case of uh, chronic rejection the whole host immune system is the main driver for the transplant rejection that is the host immune system develops a, an allogenicity towards the uh, donor kidney and then uh, rejects it uh, down the line so uh, there are numerous in vitro models to uh, assess the level of immunogenicity of a donor organ towards the host immune system Uh, however i i will uh, i will introduce it in the next few slides the main takeaway point is that the current standards are not up to the mark or they are not perfect in deciding the uh, um, what do you call the most uh, matched uh, organ uh, the most matched donor for the host so there is a need for development of a sensitive in vivo model to predict graft allo reactivity and survivability post transplant so uh, moving on yeah so this is a perfect example of a potential uh, patient or recipient uh, who we recruited from our uh, kidney transplant center here at the georgia uh, medical center uh, so at the first stage we can see that there is a patient or recipe, uh, recipient who is in need of a kidney and uh, the person came with two potential related donors this is donor 1 and donor 2 so when they come in the first thing they do is uh, the clinic does is they run uh, hla typing study uh, the hla typing is the uh, first step to assess what is the level of immunogenicity between a potential related donor 1 and its recipient so in this particular case we have a recipient 1 and related donor 1 related donor 2 and an unrelated donor as the positive control like uh, or a negative control like this particular person will be completely unrelated to the recipient so as you can see this is the hla typing uh, table uh, from the hla type we see that uh, or what the report came back from the uh, transplant center is that related donor 2 is uh, the perfect Uh, donor for the recipient it has the higher amount of matches across the different hla types being tested when compared to related donor uh, one however i have to say that this hla typing is a very uh, basic technique it uh, misses some of the other uh, configurations of hla typing and especially compatibility and it there's a very good chance that if the potential donors are really highly closely related to the uh, recipient uh, some of the, uh, the results from the uh, hla typing will not be approximate or accurately predict 
the craft uh, survivability rate. Uh, in this particular case, uh, they go for a second type of uh, matching to determine the allogenicity. So that is uh, MLR. Uh, the, so the technique after HLA typing is known as mixed lymphocyte reactions. So this one is an in vitro technique. So it's a very simple one and people have known about it for quite a long time. So what they do is that uh, they take the recipient cells uh, which is shown here and put it in culture and they mix it with uh, the uh, uh, the donor PBMCs. So in this particular case, we have three different panels. That is the recipient cells mixed with uh, an autologous combination. That is autologous means uh, the recipient cells are just mixed with more recipient cells. Uh, the recipient cells are mixed with the first related donor ones PBMCs. And in the third combination, we have recipient cells mixed with the second related donor uh, PBMCs. And in one more case, we'll have recipient cells mixed with the unrelated donor just because we wanted a, another sort of positive control. Uh, they're incubated for around 72 hours and they're mixed at a ratio of one is to one. The main principle behind this technique is that if there is a level of allogenic immune recognition between the recipient cells and the related donors, there should be some sort of immune um, response observed in the in vitro technique. So the first uh, panel here shows the uh, CFSC or proliferation of the recipient cells when they are mixed with the different combination of related donor one, related donor two, and unrelated donor. As you can see here, the autologous challenge where it's just the recipient cells, the amount of proliferation is extremely low. That means the immunogenic recognition is nil or completely absent. And if you use the second combination, that is recipient cells mixed with the related donor one, you can see there's some uh, slight amount of uh, allogenic recognition. That is the immunocompatibility is not that bad actually here. There is around 16.2 amount of proliferation from the recipient cells. In the second combination with the related donor number two, there's even a higher uh, immunogenic uh, recognition and there, uh, there's a proliferation of around 22.3. And as ex expected in a, the completely unrelated donor, the, there is very strong immunogenic reaction and the recipient cells proliferate at around 52.6%. So the basic uh, idea from this study is that related donor one seems to have the least amount of uh, immunogenic reaction with the recipient cells. Uh, related donor two has higher uh, incompatibility and unrelated donor is uh, completely incompatible. So after the CFSC study, we went, uh, we investigated what exactly is the mechanism happening here. So if you look at the flow cytometry panel in B right here, uh, we separated the PBMC into CD4 and CD8 panels. And we mainly looked at the uh, immune recognition offered by CD8 T cells because they are the main uh, immune cells responsible for transplant rejection and graft uh, tissue damage. So in the autologous challenge, we can see that the CD8 T cells have uh, least amount of activation as shown by their CD25 and Grandzyme B uh, status. status. It's probably around 5.6 and both of them, uh, and I, even these T cells have very little uh, positivity for IL-2 and interferon gamma. These are the main uh, cytokines responsible for graft tissue destruction. In allogeny related donor one combination, the, the amount of activation is slightly higher. It's 17.4. Uh, as expected, related donor two has slightly higher uh, activation at 19.5%. And IL-2 and interferon gamma uh, expression in these activated CD8 T cells are also higher at 16.3 and 25.6. As expected in the allogenic unrelated donor combination, we have a huge influx of CD8 T cell activation at around 28.7. And these activated CD8 T cells are in turn uh, active for uh, inflammatory cytokines, uh, both IL-2 and interferon gamma. So the most interesting takeaway from MLRs is that this mixed lymphocyte reaction is that uh, for RD1 and RD2 combinations, it's not able to make a sufficient um, uh, amount of um, separation 
that is it is not able to uh, say with confidence which would be the better donor there is 17.4 and 19.5 is not exactly significant as you can see here so uh, with mlrs when if the related donors are very closely related to the uh, transplant recipient which is in this case uh, it's not sensitive enough to make out uh, which would who would be the perfect uh, donor so in this scenario where the two most commonly used techniques are not able to uh, ascertain or say with confidence who would be the better donor to the for the recipient's uh, immune system for the patient's immune system uh, we thought we uh, the humanized mouse model would be the uh, perfect candidate or a very good opportunity to develop uh, a new model for this assessment so the humanized mouse model we used here is the uh, NS is the not skid gamma mice who has been which has been humanized using the PBMCs from the recipient of that uh, transplant patient. Uh, we didn't go for the uh, humanized uh, CD45 positive uh, uh, humanization because uh, using the PBMCs has some distinct advantages. That is, we have fully functional T cells which are getting uh, engrafted into the uh, NSG mice. It's perfect for predicting host immune res uh, responses. And from the uh, established publication, we understood that the human PBMC NSG model is uh, becoming a gold standard for studying graft versus uh, host diseases. So the humanization itself was very simple. We collected around 10 million PBMCs from the recipient or the patient undergoing the transplantation. Uh, we gave intravenous uh, injection into the NSG mouse, which, has, which was uh, subjected to a sublethal irradiation. And uh, once after the injection takes place, we wait three weeks for the humanization to, take, uh, to completely come into effect. And then uh, after the three weeks, we of, uh, perform an engraftment validation. That is, we just collect the blood from the humanized mouse and check the level of uh, human CD45 uh, cells within the mouse. So uh, this is basically one of the earlier experiments which we did. We wanted to see how many, how much is the perfect amount of PBMCs responsible for uh, uh, needed for the humanization procedure. So what we discovered is that uh, 5 million PBMCs, uh, if used for the initial injection, at the end of three weeks, the amount of uh, human CD45 engraftment is uh, too less, it's around 3.9%. However, if you use eight or 10 million, the amount of engraftment is significantly high. It's around 35 to 42%. And it's, as shown in the graph here, uh, we saw that eight million PBMCs should be enough for efficient uh, humanization uh, engraftment at the end of three weeks. So since uh, these are patient samples that uh, these are the recipients who are uh, waiting for their results and they are actually in the transplant center, uh, we thought uh, we can use 8 million PBMCs for the humanization because again, these are coming from the patient. So we want to make sure that we are as um, efficient as possible and use minim most, uh, the most minimal amount of PBMCs uh, needed. So for all subsequent humanization experiments, we used around uh, 8 million uh, PBMCs. So this is the basic um, flow of the experiment as shown before. This is the recipient. We used 8 million PBMCs from the recipient uh, mature lymphoid cells, that is the PBMCs. We collect the uh, PBMCs and inject it into the uh, NSG mouse. We, we wait three weeks uh, for the uh, cells to engraft and we uh, validate the engraftment from the blood. Uh, after this, there's a series of uh, three challenges. That is the autologous, uh, allogeneic related donor one, allogeneic related donor two, and the allogeneic unrelated donor. So what happens is that after three weeks and we have confirmed there is uh, engraftment of the uh, recipient PBMCs, we inject around uh, five into 10 raised to five PBMCs as the challenge. So basically this is uh, a sort of like a, a transplantation taking place here, but not uh, without any of the organs, we are just looking at the uh, immune system. 
So the autologous group, uh, we'll be injecting 500 and rich five PBMCs into one of the humanized mouse. These would be serving as the negative control. That is, this should not have any effect. Uh, followed by allogeneic RD1, related donor one, 500 and rich to five PBMCs into another humanized mouse. Allogeneic RD2 into another humanized mouse. Again, all of them have uh, the recipient PBMCs and allogeneic unrelated donor into a separate uh, humanized mouse. Once uh, this is done, we wait for around five days for the um, exp for the uh, immunogenic recognition to take place. Uh, we did a series of uh, different days to assess the amount of immunogenic recognition. And we thought that five days was a very good um, uh, stage point for this. So uh, after that, we sacrifice the mouse and then we extract the spleen. Uh, because from our earlier study, we had concluded that spleen is a very good site for these immune reactions to take place. A lot of the humanization as well as the, uh, the PBMCs, which we subsequently inject then to go into the spleen for, uh, in, for the immune reaction. So uh, then this is the spleen from a normal NSG mouse without any humanization or anything. As you can see, there is very little splenomegaly. Uh, for autologous challenge, you can see that there is some sort some immune reaction taking place here. Uh, this is the challenge with RD1, and this is the challenge with related donor 2. And the last one is the unrelated donor. As you can see here, the unrelated donor shows a uh, high amount of splenomegaly, while related donor 1 and related donor 2 had minimal amount. So from this, uh, we uh, from the spleen, we again looked at their immune profile. Uh, we initially separated the mouse CD45 and human CD45 uh, cells, and we did the analysis only on the human uh, CD45 cells. Uh, later on, we looked at the activation status of the human CD8 T cells. Uh, we used CD25 as the marker for activation. Uh, as you can see here in the autologous challenge, the amount of T cell activation is very minimal. It's around 2.1%. Uh, for RD1, it's slightly higher at around 3.4%. For RD2, it's even more higher at 9.2. And uh, for unrelated donor, it's at 11.3%. Uh, uh, so what we can see here is that uh, for the CD activated CD8 T cells, what were their uh, expression level for the perforin and granzyme B? These two markers, that is perforin and granzyme B, are extremely important for um, the ongoing uh, tissue destruction later on. So what we can see is that in RD2, there is a high level of expression of uh, both the molecules in activated CD8 T cells. Uh, the, we again uh, profile them for IL2 and interferon gamma as well. And as you can see here, uh, related donor two is somewhat has the high, higher amount of immunogenicity or allogenic recognition in compared to related donor one, which is at 5.6 and 10.2. We showed it very clearly in the graph here. Uh, in most of the cases, especially for CD8 T cell activation, related donor one seemed to be el eliciting a minimal immune response when compared to related donor number two. Of course, as expected, unrelated donor had an immense amount of uh, immune reaction with the established uh, humanized mouse. So from this experiment, uh, we showed that uh, using the humanist, humanized PBMC model, RD1 elicited the least allogeneic recognition from the humanized recipient system. So from this model, it seems that related donor one should be the perfect, um, more, uh, what do you call it, perfect donor organ for this particular recipient. Uh, interestingly, uh, our HLA typing in the first slide showed that related donor two was the better match, but our humanized mouse model showed that related donor one is the uh, uh, better match. While MLR was not able to distinguish the immune reaction between uh, related donor one and related donor two. To understand what exactly is happening here, oh, also we did the uh, immunofluorescence staining. Basically, we took the spleen out and then we basically looked at the uh, infiltration of grand B and human CD8 T cells. In the autologous challenge, as you can see here, the human CD8 T cells are engrafted within the spleen of the humanized mouse. In RD1 also, you can see su uh, um, uh, sufficient amount of uh, CD8 T cells infiltrating into the spleen. 
uh, our grand sign b is shown in these uh, arrow heads uh, the amount of sedate is expressing grand sign b and perforant which are the activation markers is very minimal in rd1 and in rd2 is very high like you can see uh, most of the cd8 t cells actually express uh, grand sign b which is responsible for graft tissue destruction and in the unrelated donor it's just grand sign b expression is where pretty much um, spread all across the cd8 t cells which have infiltrated the uh, spleen so uh, unchallenged or controlled NSG mice and autologous challenged mice showed minimal or no splenomegaly, while RD1 and RD2 mice presented enlarged spleen. So for the takeaway message from this is that we have conclusively shown that the humanized mouse model is sensitive enough to distinguish the allogenicity or the immunogenicity uh, expressed by two compatible related donors, that is RD1 and RD2. Um, we further investigated what exactly is the expression profile or the main uh, mechanism happening here, especially in the CD8 T cells. So we have the allogenic RD1 challenge, allogenic RD2 challenge. After the challenge is completed, uh, after the five days, we isolated, isolated the spleen. Uh, from the spleen, we isolated the CD8 T cells using uh, magnetic cell sorting. Uh, we can uh, isolate the RNA followed by cDNA conversion, and then we plated them onto a transplant rejection PCR array. This is basically a 9612 plate uh, PCR array containing probes for around, I think it was around 85 different markers for human transplant rejection. So these are basically genes responsible for uh, human uh, transplant rejection within the clinical setting. It had numerous genes. Um, so the main, the the main uh, aim of this experiment was to identify those genes responsible for uh, immune rejection. And especially we are looking at those genes which are differentially expressed between related donor one and the related donor two uh, challenge. As you can see here between RD2 versus RD1, some of the genes which came up to be highly expressed within uh, related donor two was uh, grand sign B, perforin, uh, TAP, and TIM1. TAP is mainly uh, the gene responsible for transport across the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, once we got these results, uh, we again uh, looked at the, uh, 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 we again confirmed it using our custom um, RTQPCR. So what we did was uh, we just did our own uh, RTQPCR. Uh, between related donor one and related donor two, we saw that a related donor two grand sign B, uh, the grand sign B expression is extremely uh, high within the CD8 T cells. Uh, the same goes for perforin one, uh, TIM one, uh, PCAM was not significant, TAP was also not significant. What, what this shows is that these grand sign B, perforin, and TIM one, especially their expression within CD8 T cells, are some of the markers for immunogenic reaction. Uh, within uh, related donors. So we want to say that these kind, these could be the potential markers to look forward to in subsequent studies where you want to see uh, the uh, immune response between related donors to the particular recipient. So now that we have uh, the humanized mouse model results very nicely, we wanted to analyze all the different combinations using uh, mixed lymphocyte reaction and the uh, humanized mouse using the transcriptome uh, array. This first panel shows uh, the CD3 positive cells from the mixed, lymphogenic, um, mixed lymphocyte reaction. Uh, this is the allogenic RD1 CD3 T cells. This is mixed lymphocyte reaction allogenic RD2 CD3 T cells, and this is the expression profile of around, I think around 33,000 genes within the CD3 T cells of the MLRs. As you can see here, uh, the MLR was not able to uh, distinguish the uh, immunogenic profile of CD3 T cells uh, in both the cases that RD1 and RD2 looks almost very similar in uh, expression profile. Uh, this is the result from the humanized PBMC mouse model, especially for RD1. 
as you can see here, the expression profile looks kind of similar, but there is some difference here. Interestingly, if you look at the uh, CD3 expression profile from related donor number two, you can see there's a huge amount of differential expression right around here. So what this shows very clearly is that mixed lymphocyte reactions are not able to differentiate between RD1 and RD2, uh, especially uh, their CD3 or immune reactions. Well, the humanized mouse was definitely strong enough or sensitive enough to distinguish the allogenicity and immunogenicity produced by related donor one versus uh, related donor two. So after this, we want to see which are the significant pathways affected within uh, these differentially expressed uh, genes by the related donor two challenge. Uh, as you can see here uh, in the one of the main pathways, which was upregulated by these particular set of genes in related donor two was allograft rejection. Uh, there are other pathways also upregulated, including chemokine signaling, type two interferon signaling and VEGF uh, pathways. So uh, interestingly, allograft rejection is also what we are studying. So we again looked at the uh, main markers which are being upregulated in the related donor two versus the related donor one. So as shown in our previous studies, we saw a significant upregulation in uh, IL-2, Granzyme B, Perforin, CD80, and CTLA-4 for uh, within the related donor two challenge in compared to the related donor one for the humanized mouse model. So I think these were very interesting to us because since we are using both the combination of the uh, recipient immune system, that is a patient's immune system and the challenge. These are actually uh, highly clinically relevant data markers. We can use these uh, IL-2, Grandsign B, PRF1, and CD80 as uh, potential markers to uh, maybe uh, predict the graph survivability in future studies. Again, we confirm the data using our own uh, custom RTQ-PCR between related donor one and related donor two. Grandsyme B expression is extremely high in related donor two, especially among the CD3 T cells, as the same goes for PRF1 and CTLA4. So what from this uh, microarray experiment, we show conclusively that the humanized mouse model, especially the humanized PBMC NSE model is strong enough to, uh, and sensitive enough to uh, distinguish the immunogenicity produced between a related donor in comparison to the recipient. So in conclusion, I just want to sh sh say that the human PBMC and NSG mouse show efficient engraftment with up to 60% of the engrafted CD8 T cells being naive T cells. And uh, the human PBMC NSG model showed a selective pro-inflammatory CD8 positive T cell based response to unrelated donor allogenic stimuli. At the same time, it exhibited a tempered or controlled feedback to the related donor challenge. That is the human PBMC model was sensitive enough to distinguish the challenge produced by related donor one versus a uh, related donor two. It also uh, showed the NSG PBMC model showed a very pro-inflammatory transcriptional profile for the related donor two. Uh, MLR was not successful uh, in distinguishing the two uh, recipients. And uh, I think uh, with, this, uh, with this model, with this, uh, particular study, we showed that the humanized PBMC model is very sensitive and is a adequate model to assess the immunogenicity produced amongst related donors and can be used for the selection of the most uh, perfect donor during uh, clinical transplantation. Uh, I just want to give acknowledgement and thank you to all my collaborators and researchers here at Augustine University, uh, Georgia, including my PI, Dr. Kurusko. Um, uh, ne the nephrology department in Medical College of Georgia was very important for recruiting the patients for this study, including Dr. Laura Malloy, Dr. Imran. Um, and we received uh, the support and the grant for this study came from National Institute of Health, as well as the Carlos and Margaret Mason uh, Trust.